last time we had discussed the example of the scour deformation functor. Uh, this is something which is in reference in a lot of previous talks, but let me just kind of quickly recap. So we're giving ourselves a global field and a set S of places where we're going to allow ramification. <laughs> so we have some initial residual representation, which uh, is unramified outside S, S considered deformations of this thing to um, more general coefficients. So technically the test class is kind of a mouthful. It's Artinian local ZP algebra is augmented over FP. <clears throat> and our deformation functor, our classical one, assigns to such a ring A, the set of lifts uh, of this residual, residual <coughs> representation to some, some kind of row to G A, which yeah, reduces the original thing. <clears throat> When you apply the augmentation, then you quotient out by some kind of conjugation equivalence. So that's the classical de Galois deformation functor. And uh, it was Mazur who had the idea to consider this thing and who also introduced the paradigm to show that it's representable. So, under certain technical hypotheses, <clears throat> actually, this one's not that important. You just have to change the definition <clears throat> of your deformation functor slightly. The irreducibility is a little more important, but anyway, um, <clears throat> Mazur uses something called Schlesinger's criteria to show that this, this uh, deformation functor is actually pro-representable by uh, a ring. And this is the ring that we call the Galois deformation ring. Now, what we discussed last time was that there should be a, some kind of derived version, a script, a calligraphic M, uh, a derived upgrade of this deformation functor uh, whose tangent complex should be the Galois cohomology or the um, etal cohomology of this number ring of one over s with coefficients in the adjoint representation. So I think this is where we left a lot off last time. I didn't really actually explain what the definition of this thing is. Um, to do that, you, you go back to the original problem and you start modifying it away to, to, uh, to sort of generalize it. So as I was saying, a classical deformation problem, the classical moduli space is like a functor on classical rings and the derived moduli space is a functor on derived rings. So what we have to do is kind of enlarge our test category to include derived rings. So we're gonna, we're gonna throw in the word simplicial somewhere. I don't know, let's say we want Artinian simplicial rings which are local ZP algebras augmented over FP. Then uh, once we put that in, we have to look at our definition see if it still makes sense. So I kind of explained that this term needs to be treated with some subtlety. Uh, you should really think of it as a kind of a derived functor now because um, for classical rings, you can think of this as like maps from the function ring of functions on G hat to A, but now you need to sort of take derived functor of maps from functions on G hat to A because A is now a derived ring. And then you look at this lift word lift, um, you need to replace this by something called like a homotopy lift or something. Uh, okay, so then we're gonna, once we've done this appropriately, uh, then our classical deformation functor gets replaced by this calligraphic N, the derived deformation functor. So, as you can see, this process requires a little bit of care, but somehow or another, one makes analogous looking definition and, uh, <clears throat> and then one kind of is able to repeat the proof of this representability theorem by Mazur. So let me show you how I think about this. I'm going to take this here, I'm going to copy it. Then I'm going to paste it down here, and now I'm going to change this name. So this is now proved by Glacius and Mekatesh. And uh, we're gonna get that the derived ring is pro-representable, the derived functor is pro-representable by a derived ring. And then we're gonna take this and stick the word derived in. And they do this via a derived version of Schlesinger's criterion, which is uh, in Lurie's thesis. 
Okay, so kind of the moral was there are subtleties which you should consult in the notes if you really want to know the details. However, uh, kind of morally, the process is analogous once you know how to sort of appropriately derive everything. With this being said, let's make some remarks. <clears throat> so this discussion applied to any global field. However, if my global field has positive characteristic, in other words, it's a function field, then uh, the Young's conjecture, whatever that is, it, it's known and it implies that this thing is not actually derived. So I'll say this thing is classical. <clears throat> so actually we're talking about a phenomenon which one doesn't observe over function fields, kind of interesting. Also, if rho bar is odd, and the so for me, this means this forces the field to be a number field. Otherwise, then, there's no, no way for rho bar to be odd. So if rho bar is odd, then actually. I have a question. Yeah. Uh, you can hear me. Uh, so is the Young's conjecture a theorem? Uh, it's a theorem. Yeah. I mean, if you, it, so it's a theorem proved by Gates story. Uh, if you look at his paper, he's a little bit like, modest about it, but it, I think it's proven. <laughs> okay, so if rho bar is odd, then uh, conjecturally, uh, and maybe this is due to Maser, uh, <laughs> this thing is also classical. Do you have a define odd? Uh, I haven't, but someone else has. And anyway, <laughs> so if you don't know what it means, just yeah, it's a technical condition, which is always satisfied when we actually, we, we never really do Galois definitely theory without this assumption. Um, so at this point, you might be getting a little angry with me saying like, why did you spend the whole last lecture talking about drive stuff and then tell us that really all this stuff is supposed to be classical? So just a moment. So. Uh, Derivedness will arise. When imposing local conditions, specifically crystalline conditions, so we will, we will get to the point where we really need truly need derived rings. Uh, but I would also say that kind of um, as an illustration of a principle I said last time. At this point, at least conjecturally, we could either work with this thing or we could work with the classical thing, because after all, they're supposed to be the same thing. Um, but what, what do we know unconditionally? Unconditionally, one knows that this derived ring has the correct tangent complex. It, it's this cohomology complex, which I said before. Uh, but one doesn't know that the higher homotopy groups vanish. Whereas unconditionally, the classical thing has no higher homotopy groups, but we don't know its tangent complex. And it turns out that if we want to proceed, we're going to want to use this thing because we're going to want to use the thing that has the correct tangent complex. And sometimes it won't matter <laughs> what the homotopy groups are. Whereas if we use the other thing, then we, we would maybe know about homotopy groups, but we wouldn't know about unconditionally what the tangent complex was. Okay, so what do I mean by imposing local conditions? That's this next section. And basically the paradigm is that um, so we have this like number ring, O, F, one over S. And now you can map this to the local field for a place which is in S. And by the way, uh, for me, all the places over P are in S. So I'm gonna say this and uh, yeah, infinity is in S. All the places over infinity are in S. So <clears throat> this map induces a map deformation functors. Uh, I, namely, I can take my residual representation restricted to the local field. I can deform it for the Galois group of the local field. So this is local global to local restriction. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to impose some condition on the local functor. So uh, there's going to be some sub functor. I'm just going to denote it with upper D, D for condition. And uh, then I'm going to take the derived fiber product. Okay, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna denote that this way. So this is my way of saying that, hey, look, this, this not, we're not 
uh, we're not going to try to parameterize arbitrary deformations like here. We're going to force some something to happen uh, locally at this place at sub b. For example, we could try to force some kind of enforce some kind of piatic Hodge theory condition if this v was a piatic place. Okay, so that's the paradigm. Actually, I want to give a first example, which is not like that. So this is an example which I'm going to call removing ramification. Uh, so let's, let's contemplate the situation where we enlarge the set of ramified places by just throwing in some like you know new disjoint place B. Uh, then we could contemplate uh, deformations which could be ramified at S prime, um, and then we could look at a local condition at V where we actually just ask that it's not ramified at S prime. So we, we are going to put an OV here, OFV. Okay, so kind of this is deformations of the Galois group of FV. This is the deformations of the fundamental group of OFV, uh, where V doesn't divide P, which means that this thing is just unramified at V. And so what is this derived fiber product? Well, I have deformations, which I'm allowing to ramify at S prime, but then really I'm looking at V and I'm saying, no, I don't want them to ramify at V. So uh, you might guess, and you'd be correct, that this dark derived fiber product is just the original deformation functor where I don't allow ramification at V. So this is a true statement, although it not, not really requires some proof, so it's not really obvious. Um, <clears throat> but it reflects the intuition, which I just said. And this is an important type of situation to consider in the Taylor Wiles method because there you're kind of adding auxiliary ramification and then eventually you want to take it away again. <laughs> okay. So um, here's another example, which is this um, imposing crystallinity. Uh, so the idea here is, of course, we want our Gawa deformations to correspond to automorphic forms, and we basically know automorphic forms, their Gawa rotations have to, classical automorphic forms have to obey certain piatic theory conditions. So we're trying to uh, enforce that here. And so we're going to look at local conditions at P. So let's complete our, our, our number field at P. Then um, there are various types of conditions one could ask for, but that's 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 a kind of classical story, right? So classically, people you know, work hard to figure out what what should be the subfunctors of local at P deformations, which are crystalline or potentially crystalline or this or that, and that, that hasn't really been studied much in a derived situation. Like, what would be a kind of derived crystalline? What what, what does it mean for like a representation of Gawa on like a simplicial whatever to be over a supposed committed ring to be crystalline. So, <clears throat> so I would say there's some scope here for uh, enthusiastic young researchers to figure out the answer to this question. But at least uh, in one case, it's kind of clear what the answer should be. So as I mentioned last time, uh, you do know sometimes that uh, there's no need to derive your space. Like if your thing is already LCI of the correct dimension, there's no need to turn it into a derived thing. And so there's this fontaine Phi range where one has um, some kind of crystalline deformation functor, a classical one, uh, which is smooth, it has a well-behaved tangent complex and so on. And uh, one can regard that as uh, a derived thing just because anything classical is a special case of something derived, just a derived thing which happens to be classical and view that as a, as a sub, of side, inside this local deformation functor and take that derived fiber product. Okay, so let me just emphasize again, even though we either know or conjecture that all three of these objects are classical, it's important to take the derived fiber product because uh, that's how, when you take derived fiber products, you know what happens to the tangent complex. Uh, whereas when you take classical fiber products, like it depends on all kinds of transversality assumptions. 
So in fact, uh, they will be different and we should take the derived one. Okay, and so this thing will be represented, pro-represented by something we're gonna call the derived crystalline deformation ring. And uh, the key point about it is that, wait a second, let me just check if I forgot to say anything. Good. Okay, so the key point about it is, first of all, it's uh, this thing is quasi smooth. And we know it's virtual dimension. Or in other words, it's derived dimension, it's or the characteristic of its tangent complex, it's equal to the L naught from Anna Kanyarani's talk. I think this was her second talk. Um, and for her, it was a right, well, I think she defined it in terms of this kind of autom automorphic uh, considerations. So in terms of the local symmetric space, so it was, whoops, sorry. It should be negative L naught where L naught is as in her talk, <clears throat> the rank of G of R minus the rank of its maximal compact. So what we're seeing here is that this, this L naught, which arose in her talk in the context of the automorphic representation theory of G coincides with the negative expected, the negative virtual dimension of this derived deformation ring for the dual group G hat. <clears throat> so this equality here that this kind of Galois theoretic quantity equals an automorphic quantity is, is really this numerical coincidence which powers this um, calgary garrity method. So are there any questions before I move on? Also, can someone in the Zoom yell at me in case uh, the thing is below, I'm writing below the display again. For now, no questions. No questions, great. Okay, so let me just remind you a little bit more about Karen's talk. So she had considered <clears throat> uh, the following situation. There was like a residual representation, a Gatwell representation. Uh, I think it was for her to PGLN or something like that. And it was irreducible. And so that corresponded to uh, a maximal ideal of the HECA algebra, or in other words, a HECA eigensystem appearing in the cohomology of the locally symmetric space. And that thing is gonna be tempered because of the irreducibility assumption here. <clears throat> and then what was the significance of this number L naught? Uh, the significance is that when you take this homology of the locally symmetric space and you localize it at this <laughs> maximal ideal, then that becomes the length of complex that you get. It's a complex of length L naught. I am going to, um, I'm going to call this thing, this whole localized complex C naught, and I'm gonna kind of normalize it so that it's, it has length L naught, but I'm gonna normalize it to degrees, cohomological degrees zero through minus L naught, or in other words, homological degrees zero through L naught. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so this is where we're thinking of this like complex automorphic forms corresponding to this residual representation or this heck eigen system. So I'm gonna explain something. I'm just gonna sort of informally call it the rival language conjecture. That's not its official name. <clears throat> and the conjecture, I'm gonna first abbreviate this uh, crystalline derived deformation ring, which by the way, it has to be derived anytime this L naught is um, positive because it is quasi smooth. So if it were classical, it would be LCI. And on the other hand, its dimension is a negative number. So a classical scheme can have negative dimension. So it is going to be derived anytime this thing is positive. For example, as discussed yesterday, if your field F is not totally real, that will always happen. Or if this little n here is bigger than two, that will always happen. 
okay, so let R not be this derived crystalline deformation ring, then the conjecture would be that there's an action of, of this derived ring on this complex such that, first of all, you have some classical compatibility. So <clears throat> after you take pi zero on the deformation ring, you get the classical deformation ring. And after you take uh, H lower zero of this complex, you get some usual group, uh, some like abelian group of automorphic forms. And uh, we know how to make an action in that case. And the claim should be that uh, you recover that classical action. So the, the action of the pi zero on the H zero is the usual one from uh, the, the usual one that we know about already that comes from the map from the deformation ring to the heck algebra. Or in other words, it uh, comes from the attachment of Galois representations to uh, automorphic forms. Okay, so that's that's the first constraint about this action. And the second one is a kind of freeness constraint, which says that <clears throat> if I take this homology and I invert P, uh, that's 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 a module over the homotopy ring of R0, invert P, and then it should be generically free. Okay, so this is an, this is some kind of analog or generalization of automorphic lifting. Like if we make this statement for H0 and pi zero of R0, then that's saying that, that that's basically what we're trying to prove, what you try to prove when you prove automorphic lifting. So and this is some kind of derived enhancement of these automorphic lifting statements. What does generically free mean? Uh, so, so it's a module over ring. So uh, I, I mean, that is just like, or let's say where a generic point is free. The, the concern could be that, so because this isn't a classical ring, the concern could be something like, uh, well, th this support, okay, maybe it's uh, generically free uh, and non-zero. We should have made more real estate here, okay. And non-zero. So for example, like you could just be worried that this is zero um, over the generic point of this thing. You know, it's like generically these, these Galois representations don't support any amount of work forms, but we, we don't want that to happen. Is that, is that clear? I guess in the, in the classical setting, like you want every like point of this generic, of, of the generic fiber of the deformation ring to be in a support. Is that equivalent to being generically free? Uh, yes, that is. And non zero, yeah. The, the, the non zero is doing the work there. <clears throat> okay, so uh, any other questions actually about this conjecture? Okay, so uh, just to some remarks then. So this, this statement is actually, I don't think there's any case where <laughs> it can be proved unconditionally except for GL1, where it's actually already a little bit non trivial. So that, that will be explained in an article of myself with Michael Harris, Barry Mazur, and Connor Oxid. Um, but it's not trivial as soon as the field, the number field, isn't totally real. Um, otherwise, it's a just immediate from class field theory. Another remark is that um, it's not so clear, really, that this is even plausible. So. Uh, we don't really know anything a priori about what this ring looks like. I mean, we know about the pi zero, but we don't know about like what are the higher homotopy groups of this derived deformation ring. And uh, on the other hand, we know something about the numerology of this thing. And so there's actually some pretty strong constraint on what this could be in order for this ever to happen. So, <clears throat> uh, so Burrell Wallach uh, shows that actually the dimensions of these groups the HI has an interesting numerology. It's basically a binomial coefficient times some common multiplicity, which doesn't depend on I. So uh, when we say this thing, this graded ring is free over this graded ring, then um, <clears throat> that, that kind of forces the, the homotopy groups of this to have some structure. So, uh, okay, there's some multiplicity, which doesn't matter that much, but then it's kind of suggesting that the homotopy groups of this derived deformation ring should have this binomial property. So we'll come back later to see what that is, but basically uh, we don't know how to prove that even other than by proving basically like the existence of this kind of action. 
so finally, the main theorem of Glacius and Megatesh is that under technical hypotheses, and one should also add also under conjectures, other conjectures, not this conjecture, uh, there exists an action, not of the derived ring on the complex, but at least on the homotopy groups of the ring, uh, on the homology groups of the complex with the above properties, classical compatibility and this kind of freeness property. So again, that's actually already imposing a pretty strong constraint numerical constraint on like what these things look like. <clears throat> Namely, they have this kind of binomial pattern. So the proof of their theorem uses taylor wiles patching or caligari Gary modification of taylor wiles patching. And I'm gonna sort of sketch it in the remainder of this talk. Uh, are there any questions? Okay, so um, so this is going to be a cartoon of the proof. I want to emphasize this word cartoon. So if you want to see the details, you really got to look at the paper and then you'll understand why only a cartoon could be presented here. Um, and as I say, it uses Taylor Wiles patching, which was discussed a little bit in, in this summer school, but, uh, but also not that much. And it's kind of confusing. So I just want to kind of review it and maybe summarize a little bit the key points as I see them. So, so we begin with just a very. Uh, excuse me. So we only know, know this. Uh, so under this hypothesis, we only know that the homotopy group will act, or we also know like R zero itself will act some C zero. No, no. We only know homotopy groups. Yeah. So the another thing would be the conjecture itself. Yeah, the conjecture is that R zero acts on C zero. What we construct is the kind of the, the shadow that of that bit, which you see after you apply homotopy groups. Okay, thanks. So actually, I think it's like a important challenge for derived deformation theory to, to try and make more examples of this thing. Beyond GL1, as I say, we can't do it right now. <clears throat> okay, so what, what is Taylor Wiles patching? So it begins with a kind of little commutative algebra fact. When you have a complete local ring over ZP, and we're going to think of this ring R as being a deformation ring. So we have this thing. Suppose you know it's tangent complex. You know it mentions the first two homology groups. Okay, so this thing here, this is just the usual uh, tangent space. Let's call that dimension G. And then uh, this thing here is kind of whatever the next group of the tangent complex is. So it's dimension of the H1. Roughly speaking, it captures the number of relations uh, that you need. So we're going to call this H. And, and the little the sort of commutative algebra effect is that then your ring has a presentation with G generators and H relations. So like this, it has a, um, it has a surjection from a power series ring with G variables, which is mentioned in the tangent space. And H is the minimal number of relations that you need to, uh, to express it. So as I say, we're going to apply this where R0 where R is R0, which is the classical Galois deformation ring. So uh, this is the source of these like box, pictures of boxes that Emerton was drawing. So this means, in other words, that we can, we can take this Galois deformation uh, space and put it into a box. And there's, a, there's an, uh, an axis on this box for every Xi, and then there's like a hypersurface for every Fj, and you take, intersect these hypersurfaces, and that's what this, spectrum of R looks like. Okay, so it's this box. And the idea of, okay, and I want to say that uh, there's a thought we're going to have, which is somewhat preposterous, but still I want to mention it, is that we should think of the derived thing as being maybe the derived intersection of the FJs. And we're going to put a question mark there. So this this thing cannot be true like universally because you could choose different FJs and get the same R, but then the right intersections would be different. So nevertheless, it's a good kind of intuition to keep in mind. Okay, so in the Taylor Wiles method, we try to allow ramifications at auxiliary, auxiliary sets QN of Taylor Wiles primes. Okay, so we, we consider some kind of auxiliary deformation ring where you allow this auxiliary ramification and you call that deformation ring 
or I call it, I'm going to call it R sub N. Um, and the key thing that makes Taylor Wiles primes special is that these are the these are primes for which this Rn keeps a presentation with the same number of generators and the same number of relations, G and H again. Okay, so it's it's quite easy to see that um, that basically anytime you allow auxiliary ramification, you can keep the, the difference G minus H the same, keep the or the characteristic the same, but to keep each, keep each individual cohomology group with the same rank, that's uh, that, that requires some subtlety. So that's this Taylor Wiles condition. And the reason we want to do that is because then um, we can think of these all these different rings as being quotients of the same common power series ring. So we can think of them as being all inside the same box here. And then you're just taking like different hypersurface to cut, cut out the different uh, RNs. But yeah, the key, the key point is that they're all, they're all now swimming around in the same box. <laughs> and furthermore, we're going to um, take this and paste it here and replace the zero by an N because I, I still want to think of what's going on derivatively as um, saying that the derived ring, perhaps you know, these equations are cannot be made transverse to each other. For example, in this uh, Caligari situation, H is actually bigger than G. So there's no way that these intersections can be transverse because otherwise at the end, there would be nothing left. <clears throat> but anyway, I'm gonna sort of imagine that, that the derived ring is some kind of derived intersection of these uh, hypersurfaces which are maybe not transverse to each other. So the idea slash hope of the Taylor Wiles method is that um, as you kind of let n go to infinity, then these relations will be pushed to zero in the augmentation filtration. Okay, meaning like in terms of the xi's, they'll they'll have higher and higher degrees, and um, according to the filtration by the xi's, they're eventually going to be pushed <laughs> converged to zero. And um, what that means is therefore that it kind of when n is infinity, there's no relations left, and you just have this thing which is just just the ambient box. Okay, so um, <clears throat> I'm going to draw a picture which was discussed before in this series, but there's this like vertical axis of DP. Here's the box, it's like this thing here. And you, you have these like initial deformation rings, which are just very thin pieces of it. But then as you um, consider these tail wire primes, you like thicken them up, you add more and more and more. And by this key point that you kept the box, it's the same box, um, when you thicken these up, you can actually eventually hope that they'll just uh, sort of formally fill out this, this entire box. Okay, so uh, let me now use this and, uh, and explain uh, how, the, how the proof goes. So <clears throat> what, what you want is a derived action. Derived ring acts on a drive uh, on a complex, okay. But what you can actually construct is only what you see at the level of, uh, of the kind of bottom homotopy group or bottom homology group. So you can construct the action of the classical ring on C0, which is gonna be H0, of this complex. Okay, so my calligraphic Cs are complexes. And then that's the psychology I want you to have in mind. What you want is some kind of drive thing, but you can only ever construct its classical shadow. So next you're going to add, you're going to allow auxiliary ramification. Um, so what does that mean? That means that we're going to replace the zero that we see here by n's, where n signifies that Taylor Wiles primes have been added. So the way we think about it is we just take this thing and we copy it, we paste it, we change these zeros to n's. And somehow this, um, this doesn't really change any, anything about the situation, but uh, when you take n, then we take n to be infinity in the sense of Taylor Wiles patching, uh, you're gonna see some kind of phase transition where things look very different. So uh, when n is infinity, then you have this picture again, where you want some kind of derived action, 
um, but kind of what you what you have by just taking the patching what you had for the ends is uh, some kind of classical action. Infinity, infinity, infinity. However, the key point is that when n is infinity, these things then become the same. Namely, the this kind of derivedness was smoothed out uh, to something purely classical, and this complex was was kind of unwound to something purely classical, just uh, just a module. So, so actually, um, if you if you think about this picture, which I explained, you'll see that this is a fairly natural thing because. Because I had suggested that this derived ring was some kind of derived intersection of these relations. And uh, that's true for R0, it's true for Rn. But as you push n off to infinity, uh, the relations are just completely gone. There's nothing left here. So there's no more derived intersections to take. There's no more concern that you might be taking some kind of non-transverse intersection. So if you, you know, if you believe in this picture, then it's very natural to guess that this should happen. Um, let me see. So let me just mention as a kind of toy model, there's a situation which you kind of know that uh, you can visualize that the same type of phenomenon happens, which is where you consider maybe your locally symmetric space, you're imagining as being like a circle, S1, and when you add level structure, you get some sort of finite cover of it. So maybe you take like a P cover. And uh, the complex that we're talking about, this thing is the homology of the circle. So um, uh, it's H0 initially a Z, it's H1 initially a Z. Then uh, each, of these, each of these covering spaces is again a circle. So you're not changing anything, as you can see. But somehow, um, something will change when you take the limit. Because when you look at what these transition maps are, on H0, it's the identity, and on H1, it's multiplication by P. And so, although for any individual like finite covering space, nothing changed, when you take the limit, you're gonna find that this thing disappears. And, uh, and this thing becomes Z. So you see that this kind of complex has been unwound in the limit to, to just something at one degree. And uh, that, that's sort of the picture that, well, this is a toy picture of what's happening in this situation here. Okay, so uh, that, that's all great and dandy, but like, what do you do once you, you know, you've only constructed what you want at, uh, when n equals infinity, because it, um, in that case, what you want coincides with what you have. How do you sort of go back down to a situation we really cared about and, and get what you want there? And the answer is you're going to sort of remove the ramification as, as was discussed before. So when you're removing ramification, uh, I had said before that you can, you can kind of recover this deformation ring with, which was more unramified at auxiliary places by taking the one where you did allow ramification and you take some kind of derived tensor product. Um, so in, in the notation of Cariani's talk, it's this is like Rn tensored over Sn. And then uh, as n goes to infinity, then you get some kind of identity of form R0 equals R infinity derived tensored over S infinity with Zp. So uh, what you're going to do is take this, this thing. Now you, know, you have what you want at n equals infinity. You're going to take the derived tensor product back down. Uh, so we're going to get um, R0, which is R infinity, derived tensor S infinity, dp. This thing now acts on the C infinity, derived mm -hmm. tensor S infinity, dp. And this thing, this thing, one kind of gets quite easily that this is C0. So this thing is C0, mm -hmm. and you constructed this derived action in this way. You take, here you take the kind of naive action, which is just purely classical, and then you take this derived tensor product and you recover some kind of interesting derived action here. Um, Except you've written it without the uh, pi star. 
You've written it without the pi star. I have written it without the pi star. And um, the problem, yeah, the reason why in the end you only get an action on homotopy groups rather than an honest action has to do with the fact that certain statements here were only approximately true or certain approximate truths were hidden in this phrase. So, uh, but yeah, Michael, you're exactly correct that uh, the way I've construed this cartoon makes it look like you actually get <laughs> the derived action fully, but you do not because certain statements that I've made are only, only true in a kind of approximate or Taylor Wilde sense. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, Sorry. Yeah. Um, what are S infinity and SN here? Uh, they are the S infinity and SN from Cariani's talk. Uh, but okay, let, let me try to give a less quick answer. So, so uh, this is something like the deformation ring of tame inertia at KLYL's primes, like the group ring. Yeah? And um, so when I take this tensor product, this is some kind of augmentation thing, which says tame inertia should act trivially. Uh, and okay. So, then there's some technicalities, like actually everything in Taylor Wilde's deformations is tame. So you can forget about that. I said the word tame. You can just think that I killed all the inertia. And then I was saying that you recover the unramified, you, you recover the original deformation ring by adding, first you allow more ramification, then you get rid of it. So that, that, that was that removing ramification example from before. Okay, so let me actually, I think I'm out of time anyway. So let me stop here. And I guess we will have a short break while we transition to technology to uh, Michael. It'll be instantaneous. But maybe oh, okay. uh, let's first uh, thank Tony for his great talk. Um, just want to warn you that the, uh, that the uh, organizers have not performed uh, due diligence. If they had, they would have known that there's some uh, question as to whether I should actually be giving a talk about uh, topics that I don't really understand. I've been actually working on this material in order to try to understand it. So to ask me to uh, explain it, I mean, it will have some benefits because I'll explain what I have understood, but that may not be. And uh, fortunately, Tony's around to uh, answer questions because he understands uh, what I am going to talk about. By the way, this one is even, even better. I think uh, this one is, that the last one was a private message. This one is, avail is visible publicly. And, uh, and uh, you know, my colleague who's, who has a position not, not very many kilometers from here. Uh, it's not about, it's not about uh, derived anything, though. So, okay. So, uh, it, it turns out, I, I have not been uh, following all the talks I've, I've checked several of the talks. I wasn't here. I watched a few of the videos. And my impression is that much of the material I've, uh, I plan to cover has already been covered, but much more quickly. So I'm going to review some uh, notions that have been mentioned before. So what was the first quote? The first one? Yeah. You mean who said it? Yeah, yeah. Somebody you know. <laughs> <laughs> And the, con uh, the context, I won't tell you the context, but so it was not, it was, it was about a different, a different uh, area in which I, I tried to learn by writing a paper. And so, uh, which is the way I learned everything anyway. Okay, so I, there's, some, there's some notation in the notes, and then, but I didn't remember the notation in the notes when I was preparing the slides, so there's a slight uh, discrepancy. Okay, you have already seen, maybe can I, can I watch it this way? Um, you've already seen these constructions. Uh, so we're working, for, let's going to start by talking about the derived Hecke algebra over local fields. There are two kinds of derived Hecke algebras that I'll be covering. Oh, yeah, this will be much better. Um, and uh, I call this uh, basic construction that you've seen repeatedly as the generators for the categories of uh, representations. The, Universal module, nobody has a better name for it. Uh, and you can write it as the uh, compact induction from an open compact subgroup of just the ring. And there are three different ways to write it, just the uh, compactly supported functions on the quotient. And then G acts on the right. 
And then it has this uh, elementary property that if you want to uh, compute the U invariance, it's the same thing as, as the G maps from this universal module. And if the pro order of U is invertible, as it tends to be when you're working with uh, characteristic zero coefficients, then uh, the invariance, taking the invariance is exact, and so this is a projective module. Now here are two cases, so all I'm going to be talking about probably this, this time is, uh, is uh, a case where these are not projective, and this is where things become derived. So the Taylor-Wiles case is when L divides the order of the, of the uh, multiplicative group. Um, and that's to say the, the order of the field is congruent to one, or Q, which is usually called Q, is congruent to one mod L. And there are other uh, interesting cases that have not been studied where, the, where this doesn't become, where this doesn't, this is not invertible. And then when lambda is itself a field of characteristic P. And uh, there are some analogies and some, some serious differences. Uh, the first case gives rise to Venkatesh's derived Heck algebra, uh, which is applied analogously to what you just saw, but uh, on the automorphic rather than on, on the uh, spectral side. And then the second case is related to the mod P Langlands program for piatic groups. And it's, there's much less that can be, most, more and less that can be said about it. All right, now, what, I'm, what I just said was, what, I'm going to elaborate on what I just said, but it was in a parenthetical remark in one of Xin Wenju's talks, and so it just went by in passing, and therefore, uh, presumably, you don't actually need to, to see this because you saw the remark, and therefore, you under, understood it instantaneously. But anyway, uh, the classical Hecke algebra of bi-invariant functions can be written in that form, but it's also the U invariance acting on, on the right, which is also the same thing as the homomorphisms from the universal module to itself. Well, one checks, and this is the sort of thing that, that can be glossed over, just the, what the things that one checks. The algebra structure on the right corresponds to convolution on, on the left, uh, on the left being, uh, that's not the left, on the top, the uh, Hecke algebra. And so we define the uh, differential graded algebra to be the derived endomorphisms of this universal module. And then you can take the cohomology, which is just the, which is the ext algebra. All right. And these are, this is derived, but in the sense that uh, was uh, well known at the time of Corvallis, although nobody, nobody thought to, to look at this. There was no mod L uh, Langlands program. Nobody was thinking about that at the time. And when the pro order of U is invertible, then of course this is concentrated into degree zero, and that's all that needs to be to be said. Now let's look at the case of the uh, hyperspecial maximal, let's say split split group or or unramified group. So suppose uh, U is a hyperspecial maximal compact subgroup, and take a split maximal torus over O with a uh, maximal split torus, I guess, uh, with vial group W, then the usual Sataki isomorphism is an isomorphism. Uh, why do I put this double quotient? Anyway, uh, it's, you can compute the, ordinary, the usual Hecke algebra of the group as the W invariance in the Hecke algebra of the maximal torus, right? Now, in the uh, Taylor-Wiles case, when L divides the order of the uh, multiplicative group and is primed to the uh, order of the vial group, then Venkatesh proves a derived version of this, which is just exactly the, looks exactly the same. Inst instead of having H0, you have H star. Now, I looked at, at uh, Venkatesh's proofs several times, and it, it involves uh, cohomology of finite groups. Um, it's a six-page calculation, and I couldn't make any, uh, any, any conceptual sense of it. So the question is, is there a conceptual proof? There's obviously, you know, there's, we've, you've heard about the uh, geometric Sataki isomorphism, and um, is there a geometric uh, version 
of this. I, I've, I've asked around, but I haven't got a, a, a clear answer. I mean, one, one should not have to read these calculations because they don't shed any, any light on uh, why, the, the, uh, why, why this is true, although it, you can read them. But right. All right, so the right-hand side is non-trivial in degrees greater than zero because L divides the pro-order of the image of, of T of O and, and T of K, and in fact, it's unbounded. So we have this, uh, this object that looks, looks like it's... Uh, this attack uh, isomorphism itself is the conceptual in a sense? Well, I mean, the, ge the geometric setup, yeah, I think is conceptual, yeah. I think that's, you know, that, that there's a picture that goes along with that. You know, so if you have a picture of this one, that would be... All right. So now, uh, let's consider the global situation, uh, because uh, as, as Tony pointed out, you're not going to get any derived structure over function fields of... of at least not any in, in the cases that are usually considered. So let's look at a case of a, of a number field. And uh, suppose uh, C dot is a complex of smooth lambda GK modules. Right? Just anything. And formally, uh, there is a canonical action of the derived Hecke algebra on uh, the Arham of just, this is just purely, purely, it doesn't, one doesn't have to say anything. This is just just the uh, uh, homo homological uh, algebra from Arham of the universal module to uh, I, I see I changed the notation into C dot, which is uh, the same thing as Arham of lambda into C dot, and therefore we've got an algebra, uh, uh, an action on the on the X algebra. Now, let's be even more specific, let's suppose it's a locally symmetric space of level U, uh, where U is our G of O, our fixed G of O at P, and then U P, uh, U upper P at the other places, which we're not going to think about. Um, so f we can take then an, an O acyclic complex of singular cochains on the uh, uh, going to the top of the level, going to the top of the level at, at, uh, at P, letting the level at P go to, go to infinity. And then we can identify the G of O invariance, the derived G of O invariance in this complex with just the cohomology complex of uh, the locally symmetric space. And so we get an action of the derived uh, Hecke algebra on a uh, on uh, the cohomology itself. All right, so uh, that's for one place, and you can do this for several places, and they commute with each other. So uh, we get lots of derived objects acting. What, when, when does this end at uh, 1040, is that? Okay. Yes. okay. I may not have enough to say, because you've already seen, seen, seen this in some, some form before. So, so here's the, this is what the action looks like. We've got this action. Now, some uh, variants. You know, if you're looking at cohomology of locally symmetric spaces, you don't just want to look at the cohomology with trivial coefficients. You want to look at cohomology with uh, coefficients in a local uh, coefficient system attached to an algebraic representation of, uh, of V. Uh, v of G, so that's, you can put a, you can replace uh, the lambda by uh, the V tilde, and it's, it also works. And I don't, I'm not quite sure what I meant by this next sentence. I think that algebraic uh, doesn't belong there. So you can replace V by any algebraic uh, lambda of G module, but this hasn't been done. I'm not, I'm not quite sure why I, I put that there, but I think it's uh, probably you can take, I mean, you can take uh, uh I mean, some. Uh, let's, let's let's be a little bit careful. So p at the lambda is the, the order of lambda is divides the divides uh, q minus one. Anyway, let's not let's not worry about that because I'm not going to do it now. If now uh, there's another version of the theory which is less developed, 
instead of looking at the, uh, this is the Betty cohomology of uh, locally symmetric space, if you have a Shimura variety, well, if you have a Shimura variety, then uh, you've already seen that the interesting part of the cohomology is all concentrated in one degree. That's the, uh, the, uh, uh, the relevant part for, for any of these deformation questions. It's concentrated in the middle degree, and so there's not going to be any room for a derived action. But if you look instead at coherent cohomology, uh, then uh, you've got more scope for uh, derived Hecke actions. Uh, so I'll say, a, I'll say a few more words about what I mean by coherent cohomology a little bit later, and maybe I'll need to write something on the blackboard, especially if I have extra time. Uh, so uh, we need to study the the geometry, the, tor the uh, uh, boundary geometry of, of uh, Shimura varieties in order to, to, uh, to do that. So I'll get, but in any case, the, uh, the formalism is exactly the same. One gets, once one sets up the, the complex uh, of, that computes the cohomology and recognizes that it's uh, derived, uh, that, that it's, that it's uh, the complex is, uh, uh, cohomology of the, co of the complex is the, com cohomology, either the topological cohomology or the coherent cohomology, then you automatically get uh, derived Hecke algebra uh, just by, by nonsense action. Michael? Yeah. So in the, in the Taylor Wells uh, primes, yes. are they allowed to divide the order of the Weimar? Uh, well, you know, are they allowed? You know, so of course they are allowed, but has the question you're probably asking, has anybody considered uh, the situation in which they order, they divide the order of the, the vial group, and as far as I know, no one. So, so I, I don't know what happens. So Venkatesh assumes that they, that they're primed to the order of the vial group. So, so, but I mean, but it's just so, sorry, but but I suppose that there's you know one can derive a little bit more, but I don't know, I don't know what what happens there. Yeah, they derive vial group invariance. Why not? But I don't know that anybody has actually looked at that. It's a good. It's a good. Uh, it's a good problem. But you know, once when when your coefficients, the order of your coefficients, divide the order of the vial group, then all kinds of other things go wrong as well. So uh, you know, you're not. Uh, so that's that's when the, you have a, have small primes, and, and and most of the time in the Taylor Wiles method, one one avoids precisely that. You know, in the, in the classical Taylor Wiles method, you know, you avoid uh, p equals two, and then you know, then with the Great deal of uh, of effort you can uh, you can cover the you can treat the case p equals two as well. All right, so now I'm going to do the p-adic version, and about this there is there's some nice uh, general statements, and the applications mostly remain to be studied. So uh, now we're going to take the coefficient field algebraically closed of characteristic p, but g is still a piadic group, and now U is a pro P Iwahori subgroup. So by a pro P Iwahori subgroup, maybe I should define, write that down, you know, use the blackboard. Um, uh, if I use the blackboard, then people, will, will people, uh, how, how will this go? There's a camera. There's a camera, right, all right. Let me, let me use this. Uh, yeah, people see me, I guess, don't they? Uh, they, they see that I'm searching the, for the chalk. So, the, I mean, the Iwahori subgroup, uh, that's, and then P. So this is, this is, uh, this is, uh, say, a G in G of O, such that G is congruent to something B in B of uh, K uh, mod, mod uh, maximum ideal. And then I of one that's uh, contained in I, this is the same thing, but G is congruent to N in N of K where modulo. So pro P, so the Iwahori subgroup is a uh, uh, integral in the upper triangular corner and divisible by the 
by a uniformizer below that, and I of one is also congruent to one along the diagonal. If, if this is, if, if this is a, a picture of a split group or a GLN. All right. So, exactly what I wrote there. Now, a basic fact in the Mod P. Langlands program that must have been mentioned, although I didn't uh, attend the relevant talks, is that uh, if pi is a smooth irreducible representation uh, of G over lambda, then it's generated by its Evo I1 invariance. And this is, because it's smooth, basically this reduces you to finite, uh, fi something finite uh, representations of uh, I of 1, and the only irreducible mod P representation of a pro P group is the trivial representation. All right. So this has been known for, oh, uh, since the beginning of the, of the uh, mod P uh, local language program about 30 years ago. Now, Schneider did what, in, in retrospect, was the right thing to do. And it, this was before people were talking much about uh, applications of derived uh, anything to, to, uh, uh, to the language program. He takes, took the unbound, by the unbounded derived category of smooth lambda representations of G. Uh, so if I of one is torsion free, uh, so which is true if P divided by the ramification degree is, is, is large, relative to, to G, then uh, he's got a theorem. First, uh, the universal module is a compact generator of this uh, unbounded derived category, uh, which is enough uh, to prove the second fact, which is that the functor taking uh, a, uh, a complex of uh, smooth lambda representations of G to modules over this uh, differential graded uh, Heck algebra, uh, which takes the derived homomorphisms. But it's the same, it's the same thing that we've seen before. The, the, the derived invariance under I of 1 in pi is an equivalence of triangulated categories. And this uh, is more or less a direct consequence of 1. And, and I, people refer to this as the Barbeck theorem, although I'm not sure whether this is historically uh, appropriate. Uh, anyway, it's it's a it's a generally known uh, sort of construction once you have have such a, a compact generator. All right. Well, what have you gained by this uh, this uh, proof that Schneider wrote down 15 years ago? Uh, well, a few things. Oh, and by the way, if I of one is not torsion free, you can replace I of one by some subgroup, pro P subgroup that is torsion free, and you get the same result. Although the the hope of of calculating uh, the, uh, the the this uh, uh, derived Hecke algebra diminishes as uh, as I as your open compact subgroup gets farther and farther from I of one, which is not to say that you can say, can say all that much about it anyway. Now, in the case, the, the underived Hecke algebra for, uh, in the mod P situation, which is just defined in the same way as before, has been studied uh, extensively by uh, Vigneras and, and Olivier. And its simple modules are re reasonably well understood. I mean, somehow, it, the, the general principle, I'm not, I'm not sure what the exact theorem is, but generally speaking, the simple modules over this are in bijection, uh, let's say, I should, I should be a bit, a bit more precise. The simple super singular modules, which are the ones of most interest over, over this he underived Hecke algebra, are in bijection with the irreducible parameters, mod p parameters, language parameters. Now, that's, that's a very rough statement, and, I, and, I, and it's, not, it's not really literally true, but that's, that's the idea. The modules over the uh, Hecke, underived Hecke algebra are the same thing as, as points uh, on or irreducible points, let's say, on some uh, moduli stack. But that's that's as far as it goes, and they they and the representation those 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 are, are are quite far from classifying the representations, the smooth mod p representations of the group. But we know how to classify, in a derived sense, the smooth mod p representations of the group because it's the same thing as the as the modules over this, uh, or the derived category of the modules over this algebra. So you might expect that this would simplify 
uh, the understanding of this category. But even for groups such as GL2F with F different from QP, and in spite of a ser- efforts in a series of papers of Olivia and Schneider, very little is known apart from the, the fact that the cohomological amplitude of this heck derived heck algebra, unlike the, the Taylor Wiles case, it's, the, it's, it's bounded and it's, it's uh, in the range zero to uh, the p adic dimension, the dimension over QP of G. And this is uh, essentially a consequence of an old theorem of Lazar that it's not. So uh, that's not, I said practically now, th- some things are known. The top, some things are known that the top degree a cohomology in the case of GL2 of F is, is entirely uh, super singular, which is, is the equivalent of, of uh, super cuspidal, for example. Now, uh, the, the article of Emerton, G, and Hellman in, in these, that will appear in these proceedings uh, presumes that all of this uh, derived uh, so to forget about the derived Heck algebra, going back to the category of, of just the smooth uh, representations, that the entire category has a, has a categorical interpretation in sheaves on the Emerton G stack, which is a uh, natural, uh, natural setting for geometrization. But there's a, a, a long and difficult paper of Roy Herzig, Hu, Maron Schrein, which in the case of GL2 and maybe also GL3 identifies a subcategory of interest uh, in the global applications, which you can think of like if you're following the, the, uh, the U.S. House of Representatives hearings, you know about the, the notion of a person of interest. And so there's a subcategory of interest in the sense that in cases when you make very special hypotheses on your localization and a maximal ideal of some Hecke algebra, then you see that the only modules that show up are ones with this property, which is very, which is already pretty, pretty obscure, hard to, hard to, hard to explain in a few words, so I won't try. Okay. Now, there are some alternatives. Uh, can you, uh, can you use this derived Hecke algebra? Can you find any properties of this derived Hecke algebra that would it could be used to pick out an interesting and more manageable subcategory of D of G. If, if, you, if you have ever looked into the history of the theory of <coughs> modules over enveloping algebras, you know, we hear about Harish Chandra modules, for, uh, which are the ones that are relevant to the cohomology of locally symmetric spaces. Uh, if you instead decide, well, instead of looking at just the Harish Chandra modules, you look at all the uh, modules over the enveloping algebra, uh, maybe that things are things get simpler. No, it's totally uh, un, out of control, and it's possible that not all the representations of uh, a piadic group mod p are actually. Maybe that's some form of manageable ca- uh, category. Maybe this is uh, just people are not looking at the right place. Uh, well, I don't know. Whether this can be this can be done, uh, but you know maybe this. You can divine from some structures, like as, as in this paper by the five authors I just mentioned, uh, the ones that are that really that like the, the equivalent of or the analog of Aris Chandra's category. Anyway, uh, Ronchetti's thesis studies the derived spherical Hecke algebra and defines a Sataki homomorphism, a homomorphism, which is, uh, well, it, it, looks, it looks a lot simpler for one thing. I mean, you can, you can actually write it down. You can calculate it. You've got just uh, the uh, group algebra of the, of the uh, co-characters of, of the maximal split torus tensored with the uh, cohomology algebra of the, of the torus. So this looks similar to, what, uh, to Venkatesh's calculation. And, but as far as I know, not very much has been done in trying to apply this to, uh, to, to automorphic theory. Uh, no, this is this is. I don't think so. I I I wrote this down. I think this is this is right. But uh, you know, maybe maybe I missed the viable group invariant. But, uh, oh, it's a Sataki homomorphism, and the second, yes, the second category, the second one is isomorphic to that. 
Right. So, so it's a subalgebra of the of that. Right. Yes. It's not a. It, yeah. It's just a homomorphism. Uh, I I think I th I think he's not always able to describe it. Right, right. Sure. Uh, yeah, well. So uh, if T of O is peep torsion free, then this is an exterior algebra on H1, and this is, this is uh, very simple. So this is, uh, and this last sentence you should ignore. I mean, I'm not sure. I think this is, this, this is meaningless, last sentence. Okay, well, you, you can <laughs> try not to look at it. Right. Um, now, uh, inside that, what the only thing that has been done with this algebra is to study a subalgebra, which is the uh, the if you, if so, if you look at this on, on the right, you think of this derived uh, Heck algebra relative to uh, uh, hyperspecial maximal compact. Just as, uh, well, cohomology of G of O with coefficients, you, you, so re remember this is the uh, derived invariance of G of o, o with values in the universal module. And you write the universal module as a direct sum. You can calculate this. This doesn't, this you, loses the algebra structure, but uh, you look at the, so this is you, you, the, the derived, the universal module is a direct sum of, uh, of uh, double cosets, I mean, this is a double cosets of uh, G of O and G of K, right? That's that's just automatic. That uh, computing the, derived, the the algebra structure from that is is a problem. But just look at the uh, the uh, classes in this cohomology algebra uh, that are supported in G of O, so you get a much simpler subalgebra, and uh, actually. In, the, in connection with Hita theory, uh, letting lambda be a Z mod P to the MZ algebra, they obtain uh, a deeper diamond operators than those that appear in the Taylor Wiles method. So, just a, just a, well, there's a uh, people who study piatic congruences, uh, there are uh, two different kinds of congruences. There are the congruences, uh, the tame congruences that corresponded as in the Taylor Wiles method. To primes that are congruent to one uh, modulo, uh, modulo your characteristic. So you have, uh, if you think of this in terms of, of uh, a Galois action, you have tame, some tame ramification. You capture whatever is complex, com complicated in your theory by uh, by tame ramification at, at other places, and it works quite well. And the other, the other is that's called the horizontal method. And the vertical method is you fix P and you let you look at increased ramification at P, and that's uh, the basis of, of the Iwasawa theory and and Hita theory, and uh, they obtain a, a version of the Taylor Wiles method, but with ramification restricted to P, and and get some results, assuming some very strong conjectures like the generalization of the of Leopold's conjecture. I should also say, since I don't know whether anybody said this, that the whole whole of the deformation theory really, uh, uh, when Mazur wrote his paper on deformation theory, was uh, a, an attempt to understand uh, Hida's results. So Hida really should should be Hida theory has been completely absent, I think, from this from this uh, conference. But it's somehow at the root of of much of what has been discussed. All right, time will not permit. And here's the question that's the, uh, well, another version of the question, whether there's, there's a, a, uh, a, a conceptual uh, version of, of uh, uh, Venkatesh's calculation of the uh, derived Heck algebra. In either case, I suppose, when the, is, there a, is there a geometric model uh, that makes this calculation obvious? Okay, I could stop here, but I think I'm, I've got a few more minutes, and this is a natural place to stop. But I, but maybe I'll be. It's better not to uh, waste these, these minutes. Uh, so here's this is where things are going to be going in the next part of the talk. Um, so G 
is a reductive group over Q, uh, com open compact level subgroup, and the locally symmetric space, as we've already seen. An associated local system attached to an algebraic, let's say irreducible algebraic representation of G. Uh, you don't actually get a local system unless the center acts in a, in a tame way. Otherwise, you get some, something that doesn't, well, that won't. And so let's suppose the center is a split, for example, over Q, and then we don't have any, any, any uh, problem with that. All right, fix a uh, point in the symmetric space uh, and let k infinity be its uh, the stabilizer. Uh, and here's the Lie algebra and uh, using uh, Gothic letters. And this notation denotes relative Lie algebra cohomology. Here's a, here's a, a reminiscence of uh, Corvallis. The, uh, at the time, Borel Wallach book had not yet been written. And the uh, relative Lie algebra cohomology for unitary representations had not yet been calculated in general. But I believe that Borel and Wallach decided to write their book as, a, as a, an effect of the, uh, the, the obvious need for this sort of thing that, that was uh, demonstrated at, at Corvallis. There was a, if you have looked at the Antwerp, uh, the Antwerp, uh, uh, Volume two, there's a very long paper of uh, Langlands, which with uh, about 20 or 30 pages devoted to calculating uh, uh, the cohomology just for uh, the modular curve using relatively algebra cohomology. So, so this is uh, this is one of the developments. So now, uh, if you have an automorphic representation, write it as uh, pi infinity, the Archimedean part tensor pi f. And pi infinity is an irreducible uh, GK infinity module. All right, I think this is something that one should see. Suppose G mod, uh, mod its center is anisotropic, which is almost never the case, in, 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 true in cases of interest. Uh, then there is a canonical isomorphism of representations of the finite Adels. Uh, the cohomology is uh, some direct sum over automorphic representations of the, uh, the uh, uh, relatively algebra cohomology of the tensor product of pi infinity with the uh, complexification of your algebraic space uh, with uh, pi f. So all the calculation of cohomology is concentrated in the Archimedean uh, part, which is where, which is natural. And this is, uh, this is differential geometry. This is, uh, this is a actual uh, a cal a calculation in Hodge theory, which becomes much easier in this setting than in other settings, but in any case, if it, since it's anisotropic, uh, differential forms can be represented by, uh, there is an invariant metric, uh, which comes along if you have a, a locally symmetric space, and then you calculate the, uh, do Hodge, uh, the Hodge theorem for that invariant metric, and this is what comes out. And this is the, uh, there's, this is the uh, decomposition of the, uh, I don't know what that four is doing there. This is, there's a decomposition of uh, the uh, automorphic forms in terms of these multiplicities. Now, if it's not anisotropic, uh, we can do this, this. The same thing is true where you just put cusp everywhere in the, in the denominator. So you take the cusp forms and the cusp, cuspidal cohomology, which is defined as the image of the cohomology of the cusp forms, and then you have to make some sense of that, but that's, that's all right. That was, that was worked out by Borel also around that time. And so they're unitary representations uh, because they're cuspidal. And the set of unitary pi infinity uh, for which this, the first part of the formula, the, the cohomology, doesn't vanish, was completely determined long ago, but as I say, after Corvallis, uh, uh, by Kumarasan, whose contribution is essential but often forgotten, Vogan and Zuckerman, they have the, the standard paper. And this is, I think, where I should stop. I'll return to this, to this uh, slide uh, this afternoon.
Okay, are there any quick questions for either of our speakers this morning? I have one. Uh, what, what's the virtual dimension? I think the table is Tony's talk. I don't know if Tony is Tony should be there. Maybe I should put him back. The dimension is defined if, if the thing is quasi smooth, then it's the oil characteristic of the looking at complex. Other questions? Okay, so maybe we'll uh, keep the longer question there for the Q&A. Uh, let's thank our speakers again.